Well, I never thought that this would happen in, in my lifetime. Please welcome Swedish singer-songwriter, producer, member of ABBA, and composer of musicals Chess and Mamma Mia, Bjorn Ulveus. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. This is really exciting. It's great to be here. So um, we're going to get to a lot of topics uh, in our, our short time together, but uh, you are here at South by Southwest primarily because along with super producer Max Martin, you are a backer of a startup called Session that is yeah. an innovative song data hub. Now, yeah. unless you're an actual songwriter, I think a lot of people don't really understand um, a lot of the challenges that go into uh, sort of housekeeping of songwriting. Can you point exactly. out some of those? Yeah, um, that's why I'm involved because I, when Benny Anderson and I wrote the song for ABBA, I mean, we were two of us in a cubicle hammering away on guitar and piano. And there was never any talk about, you know, split at the end of the day. <laughs> but it's so different today because there, you, there can be 10, even 15 mm -hmm. writers on the same song. In different parts of the world. In different parts of the world uh, and writing at different times. And you can imagine that the, there's, there could be conflicts. I mean, one of them thinks he's getting 25, when the others think, no, he's getting 15, you know. So what we try to do is to uh, get the metadata right during the creative process, when everyone is kind of on board and can decide, yeah, this is right, instead of trying to piece it together a year later when the song is released, you know, by phone calls, emails, it, it, it's, it, it is the cause of so many conflicts that lead to um, writers not being paid. Um, so how does, uh, and by the way, I, I, the original name of the company was Oddly, and uh, I went to the site, and there's actually a really great video explainer that explains how the site works, so if you're curious, check it out. Yeah. Um, how do Session, how do, uh, how do you make money from the whole process? Uh, me personally, I don't know yet. It's like with Google. We're just doing it, and then we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a story about Google anyway. I yeah, don't know. no, it makes uh, sense. The, it's the first three years, the, you know, uh, eventually maybe. But, uh, I mean, at my age, I'm interested in this vision I have of how the future could be for songwriters. Mm -hmm. That's primarily what's driving me right now. Uh, I can appreciate that, and I know a lot of musicians uh, who do as well. So. On to ABBA. Uh, you've re, re, you've reunited, reunited, excuse me, to record two new songs yeah. set for release later this year. Uh, as I understand it, one has been described as a classic and the other as timeless. Um, <laughs> that's, okay. that's what I read. Yeah, yeah. So well, that, it's, it's, you know, roughly right, yeah. So what does that mean? Can you describe them at all to us? There are people who really want to know this. Yeah, I mean, I know, but it's very, you know, without me singing, it's very hard to, to explain, and I won't be singing. <laughs> so, <laughs> Good um, to know. But it was quite amazing, you know, getting together again after. I mean, the last time we were in the studio, I think, was together, was in the beginning of 1982. Wow. Yeah. And then suddenly there we were, the four of us, in a control room, in a, in a very familiar environment, and looking at each other and thinking, what the hell? It was like yesterday. It just came rushing back, you know, in, in seconds. Really? So yes, the spark it was just that quick? Yeah, it was that quick. So familiar. And, um, you know, we have really strong bonds obviously because sure. of everything that we've gone through and the fact that we are not forgotten today. Uh, so there was a very, very special atmosphere in that room and all of us enjoyed it immensely to do something together again. When will these two songs be released? Hopefully. I mean, there's, there's a, a video being created right now of one of those songs with um, digital copies of ourselves. This is what I was going to get to, okay. Yeah, they're going to sing this new song, and that's taking a lot of time to create these avatars. Right, okay, so that's what I, ah, yeah. you beat me to the punchline. So yeah. there's going to be a tour, but it's going to be with avatars, avatars, get yeah, it? Yeah, well, that's, <laughs> I don't know uh, about that name, but anyway. I love that name. Yeah, Stick with that name. Yeah, I, I approve, I approve. You approve, okay. <laughs> so are they, now, is this gonna be not necessarily a tour, it might be, 
an attraction somewhere mm -hmm. in, a, in a big city, uh, something. It's not, it's not like a, a concert. It, we don't know exactly how to describe it. It's experience, attraction mm. kind of thing, um, which people will, you know, they have to go there and see what it is. It's very hard for me to explain. Okay, because my first thought when I read about it was something almost like when they premiered the Tupac holograph. Uh, uh, no, it's not a hologram. Uh, okay. No, it's not that. It's, it's, it's probably be hu one huge screen or huge screens with these heads mm. on body doubles uh, performing and there will probably be a live band as well. Whoa, okay. But as I say, we're in the creative process right now, so we, I can't exactly tell you how it's going to be. That but it's going to be something new and something no one has done before. Well, that sounds like it. It sounds very complex, and you're, you're live is. people and also yeah. the, the digital. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so your, your heads will be on these bodies. What era? will the avatars represent? Are we thinking 1972, 1990s, yesterday? Yeah, that was a question they put to us. Where do you want to be? Who do you want to be? And Benny and I didn't have much say in that because both of the girls said 79. <laughs> <laughs> that, was their, that was the peak for them. Yeah. Uh, uh, well. How did this whole concept come about? It was actually Simon Fuller who approached us. Ah, of course. Yeah. yeah. And this is about three years ago. He's a genius, yeah. And and he uh, he had this idea, and and we thought, yeah, this is exactly what we're about doing something no one has ever done before. There's so many ways to experience ABBA. It, it really is mind blowing. Um, you were really busy in the movie business last year. Yeah. The Mamma Mia, Mamma Mia sequel grossed worldwide close to four four hundred million dollars. Yeah. Um, that's one of the biggest movies of the year, if you go and you look at the list. Uh, were you surprised? I mean, obviously you probably weren't surprised by the sex of, success of that movie, but were you su surprised by the success of the original musical that you put together? Oh, yeah. Which is, on the 6th of April, 20 years in, in London. Oh, wow, congrats. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that, that was an experiment. I mean, no one had ever done that before. The idea that Judy Kramer, the producer, came with was to weave a story around existing songs. And there are about 100 songs in the ABBA catalog. And, and the writer, um, she could, she, uh, Catherine Johnson, she could choose any of those songs as long as we, she could write a credible story. Mm -hmm. and, and no one had ever done that before. That was the, what they now call the jukebox musical. Yeah. That was the first one. It, it, it really almost does seem like alchemy, combining your music with, you know, quality screenwriting. It's, it doesn't, it just isn't obvious that it would be a success. <laughs> you know what I mean? No, but, but when you write in the, in the middle of it, before it has happened, you never know. Um, you lose self-confidence in the middle of the night, and you ask yourself, what the hell am I doing? And, and stuff like that. But after the event, it seems like a surefire. Yeah. Success, but it isn't, you see. So you, you never know. You're talking about the per, from the perspective of a producer. Did you get pretty hands on in the producing of these films? As an executive producer, mm -hmm. more, you know, in the, the, the casting. And, I, uh, and in this last film, I tweaked a couple of the lyrics because there were songs that were, that were not that well known. I took the liberty to do that, which was fun. Uh, and, and Benny was very hands-on uh, recording the stuff uh, with these wonderful actresses and singers. Um, I mean, uh, oh boy, when we were, uh, Cher recorded Fernando with her own producer. We sent her a backing track and she recorded Fernando and we got it back and we listened and it was like, you know, fabulous. It was so good. And she, with that kind of mysterious, wonderful image that she has. Sure. You know, Fernando was the perfect song for her, I felt. That's almost, to me, it almost sounds sort of like a blue sky. What if you could combine Cher with 
Fernando yeah. and a Mama Mia sequel. Like, it's, it's almost like it would never happen in real life. Right. Um, what have been some of the things you've appreciated about producing film versus producing all the music you've produced over the years? Well, it's, it's fun to go into a new area and, and find out how that works and, and work in that. So I wouldn't put one ahead of the other, but I guess, you know, getting that kick in the studio of, of that final mix of, of uh, The Winner Takes It All or Dancing Queen or something like that, uh, that kick, you never get that in any other field. I yeah. mean, that is the ultimate. Um, this is a nice segue. I, uh, I think that maybe the first time uh, as a young adult that I sort of really spent some time with ABBA's music was for some reason listening to Take a Chance on Me mm -hmm. on an eight track. Uh, and it was, on an eight track? I believe oh, yeah, so. Those, yeah, those things. Yeah. Remember those things? <laughs> those <are> strange <laughs> things, yeah. <laughs> and it was played over and over again. And what I was struck by was not only how catchy the song is, that's sort of obvious, it was more about, I, I went and I asked it, well, how old is this song? Okay, I'll have to figure out how old the song was. The beginning to the song, you, you lay all those acapellas over each other mm -hmm. to make it so rhythmic, mm -hmm. to me was like, wow, this seems so innovative for the time. Mm -hmm. And then I looked up the origin story of that, that song and tell oh, yeah. me if this is true because I think I like to run and my understanding is this song was inspired by you jogging. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Tell me I, about that. I, I was uh, always jogging, I am still. I, I ran a, a marathon even. Um, but uh, yeah, I was out training, I was out running and we had, re we had written this song and we had recorded the backing track. That's the way we always did it. Mm. Song, backing track, basic backing track, and then lyric. So I was running and I was having this song, you know, and there was a percussive quality I felt that it had to have, like that, mm -hmm. which something came into my head that said, So that was the sound that it ought to have. So what words would fit to that sound? <laughs> Take a chance, of course, on me. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's how that came about. That's so cool. I yeah. love stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but it's, that's often the case, you know, that, that uh, the sound of, of the music gives you what it's all about. Are you one of the songwriters who would, who would wake up in the middle of night with uh, some sort of shred of inspiration and write it down, or when you first woke up in the morning? Um, not that much, no. More, more like hard work. Yeah. You know, office hours almost. Tinkering, tinkering, in the lab, as they say. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We used to, in, in the lab, we used to be in the lab for, for a month, perhaps, slogging away, and the, the, there'd be days nothing came, and maybe weeks sometimes. And towards the end of that period, we would go and isolate ourselves somewhere. Like, we went to Barbados, we went to the Bahamas, and rented a villa, and we would write around the block, uh, around the clock, and, and and then, you know, all associations were kind of freer in that environment. Mm. And all that work that we'd put on came to fruition in a way in, in that process. And, and we usually ended up with, you know, four, perhaps three or four songs after a session like that. And then we'd go into the studio and record them. You hear that, songwriters? It's not magic. It's lots and lots of hard work. Yeah. Um, okay, so. You're from Sweden, and what is it about Sweden? Because you're, you're punching well above your weight when it comes to the creative output of that country. You've got, I think it's a population of around 10 million people. Yeah. The amount of amazing music out, uh, produced from these musicians is, is, is astounding over the past 50 years. Why? Why is this so? Yeah, good you have question. Have an opinion? <laughs> I, um, no, I, well, I get asked this question a lot, as you can imagine. Sure. But I, I don't have a good explanation, actually. I, I just know that before 1974, when we won the Eurovision Song Contest, there was no one in the Anglo-Saxon world 
ever wanted to hear anything coming out of that little country in the north, Sweden. <laughs> it was thrown in the garbage bin, I, I swear. We, we sent tapes, ABBA, before 74, we sent tapes around. No one was interested, except one label in, in the US, and you can never guess, that Playboy Records. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, they were interested, so they released a single. But, you know, so when we won the Eurovision, I think it created another mindset among producers and writers in Sweden. It was, oh, it's possible. It seems to be possible, whereas before they hadn't even thought that was possible. Mm -hmm. They hadn't even dreamt the dream. But now, confidence perhaps, and, and that may have started some of it. And then with role models like Max Martin and, and, and ourselves and Roxette and, and so forth, more and more people were attracted to yeah. writing, I guess. I have a soft spot for Roxette. Um, uh, y so in Sweden, you, you grow up speaking uh, native tongue and then also English at the same time? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's really interesting to me. Um, creatively, uh, as I listen to uh, you know, Scandinavian music, um, there's, there's this, uh, there's qual this is quality about the lyrics, more specifically than just the music, where I feel like if, so with, a, with an ABBA song or a Licky Lee song or a few other bands I can think of, uh, I feel like if you heard the lyrics made by an American artist, you might just write the song off as being overtly corny. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the, with, because of the way that the Swedes kind of reinterpret maybe America, the, the American English, maybe even American culture a little bit, and then kind of give it back to us, yeah. there's this earnestness to it that is infectious and impossible to resist. I think you got something there. Yeah? I, I, yeah. Sh should I yeah, go on I tour do. with you and, and be a, a diplomat, an <laughs> evangelist for Swedish music? Wonderful. D yeah. I, what do you think I about that? I never heard that before, but I think you're right. I think that's exactly what we do. And, and I, I can speak for Benny and myself. I mean, we were exposed to American music um, in our teens. Uh, English music as well, but also German schlager, Italian ballads, French chansons, all of it at the same time, which Americans weren't, I think. And when we take the influences from all these countries and all, uh, all these musical traditions and make pop music out of them and write our own English lyrics, it becomes something else, mm -hmm. something exotic, I think, even. There is something to be said about living in a country where you know on a daily basis you have to rely on other countries and cultures just to get, get along, right, when it comes to everything from where's your cheese going to come from yeah. to, you know what I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, to your, your dairy. Exactly. Um, or your, Sweden you know, is yeah. such a small country, and, and that, that market is much too small for any artist to you know, sustain a long career, unless you go outside. So uh, I, I think a lot of people look to you uh, as a torchbearer for um, pop music and you know, one of the forefathers of it. Are there any artists that you've just been enamored with, whether they're from Scandinavia or not, that you think that we should be paying attention to? Well, there's one American girl that I saw a couple of days ago. I'm not sure I know her name exactly. Billy Illy. Oh, Elish. Yes. Yes. Ah, yes. oh, what a talent. She, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Oh, she, she, she's uh, already established, I, I suppose. Was this here at South by Southwest you discovered this? No, no, no. I, I saw it uh, maybe a week ago in mm -hmm. Sweden, YouTube or something. What, what, uh, since you've, you, you gave your talk, uh, what are um, some of the, your favorite takeaways from the festival you've had? Well, I've only been here for a short while, so... Yeah. so um, Didn't get smacked in the face with a, a taco or a band uh, as you well, walked off the plane? One thing I've noticed is that people, people are very friendly yeah. here in Austin. Um, it, it's, it's a different uh, kind of feeling than, than you, you're in New York or, or, or L.A. They're kind of friendly, and uh, it's... Uh, and it's very much like Stockholm in that the size is roughly the same mm -hmm. and, and it's not that huge, you know. Um, I think I like it here. 
All right. Yeah. Well, we'll have to leave it at that. Austin is the Stockholm of Texas. Yes. Uh, well, <laughs> Johan Oveas, thank you so much for being here. And I want to thank everyone Pleasure. who's watching. Please make sure to check in on our live stream schedule for tomorrow. We will have interviews with Wyclef Jean, Lauren Mayberry from Churches, and a whole lot more right here on southbysouthwest.com slash live.